You're watching Tag TV. You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. While Pakistan, in a bid to misguide international community, has been peddling fake anti-India narratives, people from its own backyard have come all the way to the United Nations to expose its hypocrisy and bigotry. Persecuted Baloj gave an account of their everyday ordeal in a briefing held on the sidelines of the 42nd session of the United Nations Human Rights Council. Balot spoke of how the unbridled army generals and ISI have unleashed barbarity in their Balochistan and have plundered almost everything that belonged to them. A report. A briefing titled The Humanitarian Crisis in Balochistan, held on the sidelines of the ongoing UNHRC session, exposed Pakistan's atrocities in Balochistan. The event principally aimed at educating the world about the rampant human rights violations being carried out by the state agencies with impunity. It also focused at the regular and constantly rising numbers of Baloch becoming victim to the multi-pronged cruel designs of Islamabad. Human rights defenders and political activists also condemned Pakistan for trying to internationalize the issue that is an Indian prerogative and pushing the real humanitarian crisis of Balochistan under the carpet. The foreign minister, Shamut Qureshi, gave a speech that he absolutely gave a speech that he 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 gave زیادتی ہیں وہاں پر جو لوگ مر رہے ہیں جو لوگ سالوں سال غائب ہیں تو اس کے حوالے سے تو وہ نہیں بولے گا اس لیے ہم یہاں پر ہیں اس لیے ہم دنیا کو اس کی جو جھوٹ ہے وہاں پر اس کو ثابت کرنے کے لیے ہم یہاں پہنچے ہیں بلوٹس ایکیوز that the region was occupied by Pakistan immediately after the partition of انڈیا and since then have been ruling it as an autocrat The activist stated that Pakistani army continues to carry out operations in Balochistan that have led to an increase in the number of enforced disappearances across the region. Do you allow the, the media and the United Nations delegation to go and find out what they did to my country? Balochistan was a country. You just born. You are given by the India. You are a part of India. You are ashamed to be called Indians. This is an artificial country. You have to correct yourself. And please get out of my, my land. You are not superior to me. We can rule our land. Different data available in the public domain suggests that thousands of Baloch have been abducted and thousands others have been killed in the bogus operations carried out by Pakistani military in the name of state security. A recent figure shows that around 150 Baloch houses were targeted in the 43 military operations carried out in the month of August alone in which 55 people were abducted and 31 were killed. Even this, however, is not enough to shake the conscience of Pakistan, which is planning to only escalate those attacks and not seize them. Even international human rights activists have expressed concern over the developments in Balochistan. They say that Pakistan has been brazenly operating in clear violation of the international human rights laws.
all the evidence from human rights defenders inside Pakistan and international human rights organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch show that right across Pakistan there are repeated stories of abductions, disappearances, torture and extrajudicial killings carried out by the Pakistani state and its agencies. And this is in clear violation of Pakistan's own constitutional as well as international human rights law. The standard of Baloch life has further deteriorated since the inception of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, a project which has essentially been plundering the land and resources of the region and not returning any benefits to the locals. Any resistance by the people has been subjected to brute high-handedness of army and other agencies. The Pakistani rangers have been carrying out human rights violation with impunity. The activists from the region have been constantly knocking on the door of the international community. They have been regularly carrying out demonstrations against Pakistan. They have even urged the United Nations to intervene. Now it remains to be seen if the UN, which has thus far remained silent on the issue, breaks its silence on the issue. Pakistan's repression doesn't end here. Gilgit Baltistan, a territory of erstwhile princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, is still enduring the barbarity of Pakistan. While Islamabad treats them as second-class citizens on one side, it unleashes brute force to stifle even a hint of dissent and resistance emerging from them. A number of GB residents are in prison for merely objecting to the misrule of administration. Recently, a local political organization held a conference against such arrests and demanded release of those languishing in jails for years. A report. Asiran Hunza Rehai Committee, a local political entity which roughly translates to Committee for the Freedom of Hunza's Incarcerated Citizens, recently issued an ultimatum to Islamabad and the men it has installed to govern the illegally occupied region of Gilgit Baltistan. The committee said that it will launch a string of anti government protests in the region and abroad if an action into releasing innocents who have been languishing in jails for years now is not initiated immediately. The 14 prisoners this committee talked about were charged with sedition following a confrontation between the police and protesters in August 2011. They were subsequently sentenced to an unfair jail term, which they continue to serve even today. The residents of the region, however, say that they went to jail owing to a political motivated bogus investigation into the issue. Our day is that the Pakistan is a Sadra Pakistan, the Razama Pakistan, and the Chibabarbista, and the Amara Gilgit, and the Leka, and the Chib, and the Amara request, and the Amara Jo Bailo, and the Yebe Kunahe. पुलिस की गलती से अताबात का जो सनिया हुआ है, बाप बेटे को शहीद किया है, उसके रिएक्शन में जो है, और बताएं जो भी हुआ है नुकसानात थाने का या इधर उधर, हालांकि हमारे जो बंद हैं, ये मौके पर मौजूद भी नहीं थे, बाबाजान के साथ जो साथी हैं, ये सारे उस वक्त मौजूद भी नहीं थे, बस इन्हों the government version accuses them of conspiracy against the state. However, it never presented any document and didn't reveal anything about the shoddy judicial inquiry it did in the case. While Baba Jan was convicted as the prime accused, rest was sentenced for being accomplice. An anti-terrorism court later sentenced Jan to life imprisonment. People say it is a design of the state to crush the voices that present resistance to the suppressive rule of Pakistan. Political parties have on different occasions shown their support to these innocent people, but none have had the courage to confront the system. People say that police should apprehend the real culprits and immediately release those behind bars. Tamam siyasi partiyon ne in sab ko beguna karar diya hai. Tamam ko pata hai ye beguna hai. To khulaara aaj hamara mutalba ye hai ki 
حکمت وقت اس کیس کو فوراً واپس لے لیں اور تمام نوجوانوں کو باعزت بری کریں اور جوڈیشل انکوائری سامنے لے کے آئے جو بندے واقعی اس میں ملوث ہیں ان کو سخت سے سخت سزا دی جائے Pakistan, which has for years claimed the region and its people as its own, has not accorded even the fundamental rights to the people of Kilgit Baltistan. It has misruled them with absolute high-handedness and has subjected them to unimaginable cruelty on being questioned for its tyranny. Arbitrary arrests, abductions and murders of those who it has failed to control through other means has been Pakistan's modus operandi for more than seven decades. Moving on, at a time when the definitions of international diplomacy and friendship change with the context and interests in place, one particular relationship has stood all tests of time, the India-Nepal Bonhomi. Whether you pick a chapter from history or dive straight into the present, the ties between two countries are always travelling an upward trajectory. No wonder both countries have been working extensively to secure and further strengthen the bond. One such engagement recently came to the fruition stage when they opened a 69 kilometers cross-border oil pipeline between them. A report. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his Nepalese counterpart KP Sharma Oli jointly inaugurated South Asia's first cross-border oil pipeline through a video link between their respective capitals of New Delhi and Kathmandu. It is the latest development in India's neighbourhood first policy which aims at further deepening ties with its immediate neighbours. Although the two countries have had a fuel supply agreement since 1974, the pipeline was proposed in 1996. However, it was not followed until 2014 when Indian Prime Minister visited the Himalayan nation and announced for its swift construction. Officials say the assignment was completed much before the set deadlines. कि दक्षिण एशिया की यह पहली क्रॉस बॉर्डर पेट्रोलियम पाइपलाइन रिकॉर्ड समय में पूरी हुई है जितनी अपेक्षा थी उससे एक प्रकार से आधे समय में यह बनकर तैयार हुई है द 69 किलोमीटर्स लॉन्ग पाइपलाइन प्रोजेक्ट वर्थ 45 मिलियन यूएस डॉलर्स has been funded by New Delhi and has an annual capacity of 2 million metric tons. The project will enable Nepal to import fuel from India at a lower cost. India is Nepal's sole supplier of oil which is currently carried on tankers by road to the landlocked country. It has the capacity to transport 2 million tons of petrol products annually and gives Nepal a cost-effective mode of uninterrupted fuel supply, secure from pilferage or adulteration, as in the case in transportation by tankers. It is one of the best examples of connectivity in terms of trade and transit infrastructure of Nepal and India. I would like to express my sincere thanks to Prime Minister Modiji and the Government of India for the support and cooperation to bring into operation such an important project. The immediate effect of the opening of pipeline was manifested in government announcement of Nepal government cutting down petrol prices by 2 rupees. Nepal Oil Corporation, which had took up the task with Indian Oil Corporation, has apprised that the pipeline will save Nepal about $8.7 million a year in transport costs for fuel. <music> Nepal consumes about 2.66 million tons of oil and about 480,000 tons of cooking gas currently carried in trucks from half a dozen Indian depots to different points in Nepal. Moving on, 
As states, media and analysts waited on the edge to witness the final agreement between the Taliban and the United States, President Donald Trump astonished everyone by terminating the months-old peace process between the United States and the Taliban. Despite a consistent cooperation, he said, Taliban had failed at reigning in terror and it was the death of a U.S. soldier in an attack which compelled him to take this decision. A report. In a huge setback to the Taliban, which looked excessively confident of regaining the hold of Afghanistan until a few days back, U.S. President Donald Trump decided to put an iron lid on the peace talks that had prepared a plan to restore normalcy in war-torn Afghanistan. Trump, who asserted on hitting the insurgents hard, said that Taliban could not be trusted with its promises as it neither ceased nor eased its attacks in Afghanistan despite the peace process accelerating and making gains in every other meeting. Trump, who has maintained his position of bringing his troops back to the country, said that he could not bear the fact that his men were being targeted by the enemy. They're dead. They're dead. As far as I'm concerned, they're dead. They thought that they had to kill people in order to put themselves in a little better negotiating position. When they did that, they killed 12 people. One happened to be a great American soldier, a wonderful young man from Puerto Rico, families from Puerto Rico. And you can't do that. You can't do that with me. So they're dead as far as I'm concerned. The agreement which United States had fully agreed to stipulated the phased withdrawal of 14,000 U.S. troops currently stationed in a non-combative role in Afghanistan. Until last week, it looked like the two sides had made a significant progress. The states had even assured that more than one-third of its troops will move out in just over four months of signing of the deal. However, it's clear that the Washington was closely and constantly observing the plan and plots of Taliban and wanted to surprise them when they became intolerably overbearing. We've recalled Ambassador Halilazad back to Washington. Uh, we've been working on this problem set for a number of months now and frankly had made uh, real progress with the government of national unity, President Ghani, as well as with the Taliban. Meanwhile, Afghan president, seeking to regain a hold on the peace process, made a fresh call for peace with the Taliban, but insisted on a ceasefire. Ghani's comments to a meeting of military leaders in Kabul came amid general uncertainty over the future of efforts to end 18 years of war in Afghanistan after U.S. President Donald Trump's abrupt cancellation of talks with the Taliban. Taliban, which was calling the shots in past few months, had denied talking to the Kabul establishment, calling it a stooge of the West. Ghani said that peace could not be unconditional and repeated demands for a ceasefire that the Taliban have so far refused. In Afghanistan, we have a lot of work. There are two important issues. یاو سولد، او بل انتخابات. ولس ویریدی از مذاکرات به قید و شرط او سولا به قید و شرط ند. او اوز مذاکرات به لوربند غیر ممکن دی. مک مذاکرات تا تیاریم. اما که طالبان فکر کهی چه مک دارهی 
Das Mariano ta u gora. Zuamba de se darki. Semblava de mata si. While some have expressed shock, others have hailed the decision of ending talks with the Taliban as they say they knew that talks would be fruitless. Various analysts have said in the past also, the Taliban which runs from the man and material support of Pakistan will never eliminate the Al-Qaeda camps. There are concerns regarding the deal among the civilians as well, with fears that Afghanistan could be plunged into a new civil war. They believe that such deal would subsequently herald a return of Taliban rule and allow international militants, including Islamic State, to find a refuge. Moving on. News from different media channels might suggest otherwise, but it's not all gloom and despair in war-torn Afghanistan. There are tales of hopes too. Meet 17-year-old Afghani girl and her band members who have dived into the music industry and people have embraced their ability to express their love for the craft. There are stories of sacrifice and compassion that have become an inspiration for everyone in the war-ravaged nation. Let's have a look. Taking a group of street kids to a Kabul cafe, the 17-year-old Afghan girl Masuma Mohammadi and her band members teach them music from playing instruments to reading notes. <laughs> Apart from this, Masuma and her band have also been supporting these children financially by investing most of the concert earnings in the education. اینا باید ای سن خود همو در رویای کودکان خود باشه همو مکتب باید بخونه باید درس بخونه ما د چشم اینا همه یعنی ناامیدی را دیدم ما خواستم که مثلا اوق خود مثلا هنری که دارم بتونم از استفاده کنم و برای اینا درس بتونم و اینا را مثلا یک چیز برشان یاد بتونم Teaching children is just one aspect of the band's advocacy as they have been trying to warm the hearts of the people since they formed their group in 2018. ایت نمی ترسم که در سرکه های کابل موسیقی اجرا کنم و موسیقی را نوز دوست دارم و روزومندش هستم و در آینده می خواهیم یک رهبر یک موسیقی خوب شد. Apart from paid concerts, they also stage free public performances from time to time, especially after bombings to cheer people up, a rather bold move for a teenage girl in a deeply conservative country where the Taliban once outlawed music and Western-style popular culture is widely frowned upon. <laughs> ما برای تمام طالبایی که میخوای با ما بیای سول کنه برشان میگم که از همی از همی وقتی که مثلا از همی دقیق میگم که زمان که میای مثلا با دولت ما سول میکنه اصلا اجازه همی وقتی که میای حتما همی فرهنگ قبول کده آمده و اصلا اجازه کار نداره که مخالفت کنه یا به مانه ما شوه پس ما اجازه نمید Though Masuma and her band gets ridiculed a number of times for their music, but at times they do receive positive feedback from the audience. The teenager's biggest concern is a possible return of the Taliban if peace negotiations fail. She also hopes that one day Afghanistan will accept music in its entirety and people like her able to express their love for the craft. Such bands are defying stereotypes and doing the unthinkable while inspiring millions of children in the war-torn country. It's the people like Masoma who even turn their obstacles into opportunities and their problems into possibilities. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.